up, Freedom Church? How we doing? 8.30 in the morning. I like it. We're awake this morning. What's up? If you're joining us online, we're so glad that you're with us. If we haven't met, my name is Pastor MJ. Man, who's excited to dive into the finale of March Madness? Hey, how many of you guys, this didn't go very well on Thursday, but I was just curious. How many of you guys still have a perfect bracket in March Madness? Anybody? Anybody? Just me? I'm the only person in all of America who has a perfect bracket? Nah, mine got busted on Thursday. But hey, we're diving in tonight, if, this morning. If you've got your Bible, we're going to be in Mark chapter 16. We're going to be diving in, wrapping up March Madness, making the devil mad in March. But for me personally, before we dive in, March Madness, the basketball tournament at least, has always been something really close to me and my family. I've got some pictures I want to show you. My dad was a college basketball coach for 16 years of my life. And so you see, he coached at USC. Me and my brother would get decked out for the tournament. I think I got a couple more. That's me at the March Madness tournament. Just, you know, put me in the game, coach. I'm ready. And then that's me and my dad. My, my sister wasn't alive yet. She's gonna be mad that she's not in that picture. But that's, March Madness is super dear to our family because this is, what, this is where I grew up. I grew up every March watching my dad on TV, watching the tournament. And, you know, it, it was just one of those super special things growing up where it was like almost ingrained into us. And so every year the March, March would roll around and we would know it's time to fill out the brackets. We'd, we'd play all sorts of games. It would really just like in the middle of the craziness of life, it would draw us all together. And it would be something that we would always just look forward to. But one thing that I will never forget growing up in March, March Madness, you fill in the blank is, you know, as a kid, I didn't necessarily care as much about the actual basketball games. I was just a little kid. I was looking for my dad on TV and I was hoping that the teams that I circled on my bracket were correct. I wanted to win. But the one moment that I always looked forward to year after year after year, if you follow March Madness, you'll know this. It's it comes at the end of the tournament, right after the champion is crowned. They, they roll the song, and it's called One Shining Moment. And really what this is, is it's, it's a compilation of the greatest moments from the tournament. All of the highs, all of the lows, the crazy buzzer beaters as teams are going crazy, the, the players in defeat lying on the floor. And maybe you don't know what I'm talking about right now, so I want to show you a little bit of what this One Shining Moment looks like. You see players erupting as St. Peter's was not supposed to win. And they won, and this would be rolling through the song, and you can keep going. Teams going crazy, the, the electricity of victory, but then also just the disbelief of loss. And, and the tears of, 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 of men as they came up short. And I watched this video, and I, 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 every year, year after year after year, this kid actually became a meme from just his team losing and the, the, the thrill of defeat. But I'm telling you this story because what I remember is I remember every year the, the music would play. It's an unforgettable song if you've heard it. And my mom would be crying on the couch already because it's emotional. And she'd be sitting there like, oh, I feel so bad for these guys. And I remember this moment because really, if we were to sum up one shining moment, is it is a testimony of the tournament. Like it is, it is the message behind the madness in, in, in this tournament. Is it's the thrills of victory, the, the lows of defeat. And really the reason why there's people, there's people who care more about this moment at the end of the tournament than the entire tournament itself. They will tune in. They don't know the first thing about basketball, but they want to watch one shining moment. Why? Because there's something about a message that pulls you in somewhere. There's something about the reality of life that guess what? You see that guy on the floor gripping his coach crying and you can relate to that in some level. There's some moment in your life where you're like, man, I know that feeling and I know what he's going through. And you see the victories in the highest moments. And there's been moments in your life where maybe it wasn't on a basketball court, but you can relate to the thrill of victory. And what is it doing really? They're so smart. The reason they play this video at the end is because it pulls all of America who's watching in. It lets everybody, it pulls them into the court. Can I tell you this? I want you to understand as we dive into Mark chapter 16 this morning is that your testimony, your message can bring people to places that they've never been. That as I sat there every March watching one shining moment and seeing these basketball players in the reality of their emotions, it pulled me into the court. It pulled me into Indianapolis. It pulled me where, wherever they were because there was something so powerful about just the reality of life. And can I tell you, your message, your testimony, your stories of thrilling victories and, 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 and defeats, they can bring people closer and nearer to God than maybe they would ever be on their own. Your story, your message is powerful. And so as we've been talking about 
your message and your testimony. Let's just dive into Mark chapter 16 at the end of the book. This is, this is the last chapter of Mark. And Jesus gives really clear instructions. I don't know about you, but I'm super grateful that when Jesus died, rose again, and, and he's back, he doesn't give this list of 25 prerequisites of what to do in order to accomplish his mission. He says this one thing, and I love the simplicity of it because it, re- it applies to you and me today. Mark 16, verse 15, this is what it says. And then he told them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Jesus gives us the most uncomplicated next step. He shows back up to his disciples. Can I, can I tell you what has taken place in the life of the disciples since the moment Jesus died until this moment when he reappears to them in Mark chapter 16? Do you think they just went out and radically transformed the world and told them all about who Jesus was? No, they were hiding, terrified in fear that their lives were gonna be lost too. And Jesus shows up and he says, hey, do you wanna know what I need you to do? There's one thing, if you do one thing well, it's this. Go into the world and tell everyone the good news. This word good news in the original language, it's, it's euangelion, it's a super fun word. You maybe you just wanna use it at work this week. You can just be like, euangelion. But euangelion, really all that this means is Good news, good message. Can I tell you what's fascinating? Because you hear what Jesus says here, and I guarantee you there's a lot of us in this room and a lot of us joining online who it's like, I'm not qualified to go preach the good news. I didn't go to Bible college. I haven't been going to church that long. I don't know the right things to say. I don't know enough of the Bible, so how am I supposed to share the gospel? Isn't it interesting that when Jesus gives this command, we're reading Mark 16, but Mark 16 wasn't a thing yet. It was just the words coming out of Jesus' mouth as he's with his guys. And so as Jesus says, go and share the gospel, go and share the good news, it's not, hey, go and repeat the book of Mark to everybody. It's twofold. This is what Jesus is saying when he says, go and share the euangelion to everybody. Jesus saves and Jesus saves me. What are you supposed to share? That wherever you go, you would be telling people, Jesus saves and let me tell you how he saved me. You don't need to know the book of Mark. You don't need to know all of the Bible. You don't need to go to Bible college or fulfill all of these lists of prerequisites that your brain and the enemy are convincing you you need before you share. These guys didn't have anything. He just said, would you go to everyone and share the one thing that you know? I save and I saved you. So, Really, this is the reality. Can I tell you this? This is the big idea. If you catch something today, let it be this. Write this down. Your call is to share the good news of Jesus wherever your feet are. That This is the reality. Some of you feel like you don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. Easter's next week and you're trying to figure out what can I do this week to make an impact next week? Can I tell you? Let me give you you a super simple process. And I didn't make this. Jesus did. He said, look down, look up, and talk. Look down. Where's my feet? I'm at home, I'm gonna tell somebody that Jesus saves. I'm at work, I'm gonna look up, I'm gonna tell somebody that Jesus saves. I'm at the supermarket, I'm gonna look down, I'm gonna look up, I'm gonna tell somebody that Jesus saved me. Can I tell you, it doesn't need to be a sermon, it doesn't need to be a masterpiece. Jesus is the masterpiece. He said, go tell everyone the good news. The one shining moment. What's the one shining moment in your life? That there is a God who loves you and saved you. There's nothing that will ever get better than that. There's nothing that will ever outweigh that. There is nothing that will ever bring somebody. Can I tell you that story right there, that there's a God who loves and who saves? You wanna talk about a story that will bring somebody somewhere? That's it. They don't care about your high school football stats. They don't care about your Instagram followers, but they have a dying heart that needs the hope of salvation. And you're the vessel that God uses to share that. And so what do we see here? Jesus is saying, I I need you to do one thing well. Go into the world and preach. The word for preach in the original language, do you think it means to stand on a stage with a microphone? No, no, no. It means to go into the public places and simply share Jesus. It doesn't mean to talk for 35 minutes. It's this picture. Would you publicly proclaim Something in Jesus is saying, would you publicly proclaim me? I I hope you catch the simplicity of Jesus' message here because he's casting this wide net so that every single person in this room gets to participate. It's not reach level 10 and then I'm gonna ask you to do more. It's the simple picture. You're walking, go share who I am. Point blank, period. 
But now here's the reality of where we're going to really dive in today as we wrap up March Madness is, sure, I can sit here and tell you that Jesus says, go share this good message. But a lot of us are still probably going to say, how and where? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm really ready. Like that sounds good. But once we leave the building and we're actually in the moment, like we're like, ah, MJ, can you come do it for me? I don't know if I'm really ready. So here's what I want to talk about today. This is the title for the message. Turn to your neighbor and say this, prepare to share. We're going to prepare to share so that when we leave here, right, we don't just hear some things that sound good. We can get some real raw materials so that as we walk out of this place, we have a room of a couple hundred people and however many hundred people are joining us online saying, no, no, I can actually do this. I'm prepared for this moment. Can I tell you why Jesus told the disciples this in Mark chapter 16? Because he wanted them to be ready to do what he called them to do, not caught by surprise. So who's ready to get ready this morning? This is where we're going to be diving into. We're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, the writer of 2 Timothy, his name's Paul. He's a, a literal Christian legend. He wrote the majority of the New Testament of our Bibles. So all of these letters outside of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most of these letters in the New Testament, Paul's that guy. He's written it. He's lived it. Can I give you a quick gl a glimpse of Paul's testimony? He was a Christian killer. Then Jesus showed up in his life, and now he's, saving, he's, he's share, sharing the message that Jesus saves. So if you think that you can't have a message, guess what? God took a murderer and turned him into a missionary. So he can do something for you. This is the guy who's writing it. In, in 2 Timothy, Paul's writing this letter to a young guy named Timothy. Timothy is like Paul's, Paul's little, little apprentice. He's, he's probably between a teenage years and in, in mid to early 20s. Like he's a young guy. And Paul is understanding this. I'm not going to be around forever, so I need to prepare somebody to be ready when I'm done, right? Paul's message here is a message of preparation. I need somebody to be prepared to share. And so we're going to read 2 Timothy chapter 1 here together and understand that this is the message on how to be ready. So this is what Paul says. 2 Timothy 1, starting in verse 3. He says, Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. You see, who he's, he's telling us who he's writing to. He says, night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. We're going to stop right there for a second. Did you catch what it is that Paul tells Timothy? The first thing he tells him. He doesn't say, Timothy, there's a bunch of continents that need Jesus. He doesn't say, Timothy... Give me the report of everything that you've done. He doesn't say, Timothy, I need, I need, you're not doing enough. Did you catch what he says? He says, Timothy, I've constantly been praying for you. Can I ask you a question this morning? Is there people in your life that you are constantly praying for? Are there people in your life that you are constantly lifting up? Are there people that we're constantly contending for? Because before Paul can encourage him to be equipped in any way, what does he say? Timothy, I want you to know that I'm believing in you and I'm praying for you. Can I tell you this? This is the first point that we're going to be diving into today, that prayer is our preparation. That if you want to be a part of this, this mission that Jesus is building, if maybe you're not confident to share this, this message, this testimony of your life, can I tell you where it all begins? Prayer. It begins with us reaching out to God, saying, God, we need help. God, we need your presence. God, we need you to move. And sometimes, can I, can I tell you, the, can we just be real this morning? The difference between being a young believer and a mature believer is what your prayer life looks like. That young believers, and don't take this as any offense, this, 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 this is totally okay. But there's a lot of us who, who are maybe lack maturity in our faith and our prayers are me-centric. God, I need this, I need this, I need this. God, help me with this, God, help me with this. Guess what, that's okay. God tells us to come to him like that. But maturity as a believer looks like, looks like this. It's a, it is moving the needle from God, I need this, to God, they need this. God, I'm going to lift them up because they're not at a place to lift themselves up. Who are the people in your life who don't know Jesus yet, but you're the, you could be the reason that they get prepared for it, that your, your prayers have power. And so Paul is understanding this to Timothy. He's like, hey, before I ask anything, before I tell you anything, you need to know something. I've been, I've been covering you constantly. I've been, I've been asking God to be with you. Timothy, please understand this, that I'm constantly remembering you in my prayers. Are we constantly praying for people? Because if I'm being honest with myself, if I looked at the amount of prayer I spent yesterday, 
It was probably less than 10 minutes. And Paul's like, I'm constantly doing this. I'm constantly covering this. And can I tell you, do you want to know where Paul's at right now as he's writing this, this message to Timothy? Paul's rotting in a prison cell. He's about to be executed for simply preaching Jesus in the world. Paul's circumstances aren't good here. He's about to die. He's, he's rotting in prison. You want to know what my, my letter would have said if I was Paul right now? Hey, Timothy, will you please be praying for me because I'm rotting in prison? Timothy, will you send help? Timothy, what, what are you doing for me? And what does Paul say? Yeah, I'm in prison, but I got the gospel of Jesus, so I'm fine. So I'm praying for you. What would happen if we had a realization that, yeah, our, uh, the scriptures actually say that life is going to be troublesome, that there's going to be these heavy moments. But can I tell you, I'd rather experience hell today because I know I'm going to live in heaven forever. I don't need heaven today because I know where I'm going. But the lie that the enemy would tell us is that we need perfection today and we might miss out on it for eternity because our eyes are clouded and blinded. What is the American dream is to experience heaven on earth. I'm not interested in the American dream. I want the dream of the gospel. I want Jesus in my life. And so who are the people in our lives that we can say, you know what? I know the dream that you're chasing, but I know there's more for you. So I'm gonna constantly be lifting you up in prayer. But so often what happens is we get discouraged because God's timing isn't our timing. And so we give up on the prayers. I, I can't imagine the amount of parents in this room who are praying for their children to find God. And maybe you were hoping that it took place in middle school and it didn't. And you were praying that it would take place in high school and it didn't. And now your, your, little, your little baby is a grown adult. And maybe you're discouraged because your prayers you feel aren't being answered. What would happen if, if you just persisted with consistency? I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep covering. I'm going to keep believing that God's going to do what he's going to do. I saw this video this week and it just blew my mind. Because, you know, I think sometimes I can fall into that category of it's like, man, this isn't happening, so I'm going to switch my focus. That was, the enemy would love for you to switch your focus from eternal things. But I saw this video this week on Instagram of this guy. He had to be in his late 30s, early 40s. Rough-looking guy. You can tell he's got a story to tell. And he's talking, really, what's he doing here? He's sharing his good news. He's sharing his message. He's talking about his life. He's like, I went through all these these things, I ran away from my family. I didn't, I didn't like the structure of home. I, I went and I joined the military and I experienced all these crazy things and I was running from God my whole life. He was like, and I've experienced things that I never want to experience, but it's where I'm at because of the decisions I've made. And then this is what he says. He said, he said but I always got these notes from my mom that my mom for 35 years of my life kept praying that I would meet Jesus. He was like, and I kept running from him. But because my mom never gave up on praying for me at 37 years old, I gave my life to him. Can I tell you that there is power in your prayers? And when we are consistent and constant in preparing ourselves and preparing others, it is like we're opening the gates for God to move in the life of somebody who might not even want him to move. Paul is, he's saying, hey, you want to do something? You want to be prepared to share? Before you can ever actually share, you need to spend some time in prayer. You need to spend some time preparing yourself, preparing others, and asking God to actually show up and do something. Because how many of you know that your message was never about you to begin with? It wasn't about how good you were or what you overcame. It was about the fact that you were that person in the video crying on the floor in disbelief of where your life was. But Jesus showed up, and he showed out, and he saved you, and now he wants to partner with you to, to share that message with the world. This is what... This is what um, Paul says in Ephesians, in one of his other letters, he says this in 618, and pray in the spirit on all occasions. Does Paul say in some occasions? No, on all occasions, not just when the diagnosis comes back bad, not just when your bank account is hurting, not just when that family member is going through a hard time. He says, be praying on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. There is a responsibility that we should be bearing, that we should be the first line of defense saying, hey, if we do one thing, if we were marked by one thing, it would be that we would be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to believe in contend on, the, on behalf of the world. This is Paul's message. He's saying, you want to be prepared to share? 
Well, then you better be prepared to pray because your prayers are your weapons against the enemy. Can I encourage you? What would happen if we shifted something in the atmosphere of our life and we became people who prayed with consistency, not, not occasional prayers, not just one type of prayers, but we prayed for people, we prayed for circumstances, we prayed for ourselves, all kinds of prayers because we really believed that God was gonna do something even if it didn't match our timelines. Prayer is your preparation. This is how Paul continues. He's like, hey, Timothy, if you know one thing, know this, I'm praying for you. And he says this, I remember your genuine faith for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And now I know that same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you when, when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. I want you to pay attention to that phrase right there that Paul says. He says, Timothy, he recognizes the faith that he has. And then he says, will you fan into flame the gifts that you've been given? Will you fan in? That's a really weird phrase. I read this as a kid and I was like, I'm supposed to catch stuff on fire and fan it? No, can I tell you what? what Paul's saying here, if we just bring this down into a super uncomplicated phrase for us to remember, what is Paul's encouragement here for Timothy? Hey, Timothy, I recognize your faith. Now do something. Do something. You have faith and you have gifts. So do something. Stop waiting for me to do something. You do something. Paul's like, I'm in prison. I'm doing the only thing I can. I'm writing to you. And can I tell you the trap of the enemy is to sit around thinking that maybe because you're young or maybe because you're a new believer or maybe because there's somebody that you have deemed better than you, I'm gonna sit back and watch while you do. No. Can I tell you number two, how to prepare to share? It's this, do something. Stop just sitting and waiting. Do something. Be a part of something. Get active. Stop just standing and waiting. In Acts chapter one, Jesus is ascending back to heaven. And when he leaves, do you wanna know what the angels tell humanity? Why are you standing here staring? Jesus is gone, but you have the Holy Spirit. So go do something. Can I tell you the number one thing that the enemy would love for your life is for you to be inactive. For you to be a, somebody who just believes but doesn't act. For you to be a person who is, you're saved, but you're not gonna go tell other people how to get saved because it's uncomfortable or you don't know what to do. I remember being a young kid, my family always went camping. My family, we didn't go on these tropical, extravagant vacations. We, we, would, go, we would go camping and it was incredible. And I remember one time I was probably nine or 10 years old and we would set up these campfires every night. We would sit and we would, we would watch the fire and my dad was going to do something. He said, hey, I'm gonna go take care of something. I need you to watch the fire and make sure that it doesn't go out. And he left and he went to take care of what he was taking care of. And we sat there and we looked at the fire and we were mesmerized by it. We thought it was so cool. And slowly but surely the fire started to dwindle and the woods started to, to become smaller and smaller and smaller. And then eventually my dad came back and there was just embers sitting in, into, in the fire pit, but there was no flames. He said, I asked, I asked you to watch and make sure the fire didn't go out. Why didn't you do anything? He said, I didn't know what to do. This is what he said. You should have just done something. Anything is better than nothing. And this is what Paul is saying, fan into flame. Do you wanna know what would have allowed this fire to keep burning? If there would have been some semblance of activity so that it could keep burning. Fan it, blow on it, move it, put some more wood on it, do something. But just sitting back and watching is gonna lead to the fire burning out. We can't be believers. You have a message, you have a story. Jesus said he made it simple. Would you go and publicly proclaim my, what I've done to you? I save and I saved you. So do something about it. But the lies of the enemy would love to keep you in the seat right here, that you're gonna come here and you're gonna go home, you're gonna come here and you're gonna go home, you're gonna go to your life group, then you're gonna go home, but you're never gonna do something with what you've been given. Guess what? You might not even know what the right thing to do is, but something is better than nothing. The enemy can't stop you from advancing God's kingdom, but he can lie to you to not move. And then don't be surprised when there's no fire. Don't be surprised when that mountaintop experience is gone. Don't be surprised when all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, I used to feel so close. I used to feel like God's power was in my life. I used to feel like he was moving. What happened? He ignited a fire in your heart. 
And then you never did anything with it. We just sat. Oh, God's gonna use the pastor on the stage or God's gonna use my life group leader or God's gonna use the leader of the team or God's gonna use the YouTube guy. Nobody has access to the people in your life better than you. MJ, can you just come and do it for me? No, I don't know your family members. You work at TD Ameritrade, not me. God has uniquely positioned you to do something with what he's given you. And what would happen if we just switched our perspectives this morning to say, you know what? It's my time. It is time for me to fan into flame what I've been given. I'm not going to be afraid. Why? Because what does Paul say? He says, fan it into flame and then remember that God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power. Can I tell you this? God has equipped you to do whatever he's called you to do. That he wasn't expecting you to just be good enough to figure it out because news, news flash, you weren't. You didn't have the power. You didn't have the message. Your message was actually a failure in death in disbelief. But Jesus saves. And he gave me a new message. And he filled me with the power that is enough to complete the mission. And so what would happen if we said, you know what? I'm gonna do something. Some of you in here today, do you wanna know what that something is? Is you didn't sign up, but you need to get baptized because you're looking for that message can I tell you, baptism is a testimony. It is the testimony of death to life. It is the beginning of the message. I'm gonna let the world know where I stand. I'm gonna let the world know that that story's over and the new one has begun. I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna do something. I don't just wanna sit back and wait. And maybe that's you this morning. You need to say, you know what? I didn't, I didn't sign up, but I gotta do, I, I'm gonna fan it into flame because I believe, in, I believe that Jesus saves and I believe that he saved me, so I'm gonna get out of my chair and I'm gonna tell the world about it. Would you stand to your feet? Some of you in here, that's your step today. That as I begin to close here in a minute, I'm gonna ask you if that's you, to just walk on out of here. We've got shirts for you, we've got sandals for you, we got shorts for you, I, we got blow dryers, I think, we got whatever you possibly need, that there's no excuse to say, oh, well, uh, now's not the time. No, now is the time. Because can I tell you something? Jesus is coming back. And he's gonna, he, want, he, he needs his church to be ready. And so some of us, we sit here and we go, oh, well, next time or, or, or next week, or I'm gonna do it. No, that you're caught in the tension and the lie of the enemy to just not move. No, we need to run towards Jesus because of who he is and what he's done. And then this is number three. Man, we just need to realize that God has chosen you. You need to realize that it's not just some God, God wants to use you. And I think this is, this, is, this is what Paul is getting to to Timothy. Because remember, Paul is a legend and Timothy's a boy. And he says this, so never be ashamed to tell anyone about our Lord. Never be ashamed about it. Never be scared of it. Never hold back from it. Be, never be ashamed. Just, just do something. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord and don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us and he called us into a holy life. He did this not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan from the beginning to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by appearing in Christ our savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life in immortality through the good news. And God chose me to be a preacher and a teacher of this good news. Yet some of us sit here and we're like, yeah, yeah, but God, God chose Paul. My name's not Paul. He didn't choose me. This is what, you want, you want what Jesus actually says? You're like, oh, I, Paul's words aren't good enough for me. This is Jesus' words for you. In John 15, he says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask using my name. You wanna know the call on your life? Go and do something. Some of us are more concerned about the destination or the route on how we do something than actually doing something. Your call is to be a son or daughter of the king, that you are chosen and appointed for a moment like this to say, I'm not gonna waste my life. I'm gonna use my life for his glory, that wherever I go, it would point to him. 
wherever I go, it would, be, it, would, it would be a shining moment that would show the world, hey, I was down, I was out, I was beaten, I was bruised, I was dead, I had no hope, but Jesus saves. And Jesus saved me when I was down. And he picked me up, he placed me on solid ground, and he's called me for this moment. Can I tell you, Jesus has chosen you. He hasn't just chosen the worship team. He hasn't just chosen whoever you're looking up to. He's chosen you. He wants to use your life because you have a story that nobody else has. You have, you have a story that Jesus saves, but he saved you. I can't tell that story. Only you can. So what are we gonna do? Hey, can I challenge you in this room this morning? Maybe you didn't even come here planning about it. Maybe you weren't even thinking about it. But I think there's some of us in this room that it, are, you're something today is you need to realize that Jesus has chosen you. He said, I want you to show the world the lasting fruit. I believe the number one lie that the enemy would have for some of us in this room this morning would literally to be to stay where you are right now. That he's moving right now. He said, don't move. Don't move. I know your heart is beating out of your chest. I know you feel the power of God moving in your life, but don't move. And I want to challenge you to do what Jesus says. Go into all the world and share the message and be baptized. Man, if you're in this room this morning and you need to publicly show the world that you are with Jesus, that he raised you to life, man, today's the day to be baptized. Today is the day for your testimony to begin. If that's you in this room, don't worry about anybody else. Can I just challenge you? Get out of your seat and head, head, head out the doors right now. We have a team ready for you, that they wanna partner with you. I'm believing that there's people in this room who need to be baptized today and you've been running from the call of God on your life and today's the day he's saying, I need you to do something. If that's you, come on, we wanna celebrate you. You can, you can walk out of your seat and head out the back. I see you over there going to get baptized. Come on, let's make some noise in this room. I believe there's people in this room this morning who the enemy wants you to stay put, but today's the day to do something. Today's the day to stop hiding and to say, I'm gonna respond. So if that's you, come on, we wanna celebrate with you. It's a party in heaven. You can walk out these doors right now. We got whatever you need. I see somebody else, come on. Today's the day, today's the day. Jesus is coming and we wanna do, we're gonna fan it into flame. And now for the rest of us in this room, you have, one of, you have a couple of these on your seat. I want you to grab it. And here's what we're gonna do, because here's what I'm believing. I'm believing that even that next Sunday, next Saturday, we're celebrating Easter Sunday together. And I'm, I believe that there's people in your life, in your circles, in your workplaces, in your family, that if you would do what we said, if you would look down at your feet and you would look up, there's people who need the gospel of Jesus. There's people who need the good news. There's people who are, who, who, they're, they're out, they're down, they're hopeless, they, they, they're, their story is over. But you have the good news that if we go to the words of Jesus in Mark 16, he said, go and share. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to lift this up to heaven. Everybody in the room, grab this invite card and lift it up. And I want, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to put somebody on your heart. Say, Jesus, who do I need to share with this week? Who, who needs to hear my testimony? Who needs to hear the good news, the euangelion of who you are that you save and how you saved me? I want you to repeat this prayer with me in person and online. Would you say, Jesus, would you fill me with the spirit of boldness that Paul mentions in 1 Timothy? God, would you give me the opportunity to share, use me so that the world might believe that Jesus saves, amen. Come on, what would happen if this, if this week was the week where we said, you know what, we're not gonna be a passive church, we're not gonna be a sit still church, we're gonna be a church that actually got out of the walls, a church that actually went into the world and said, Jesus saves, Jesus wants to save you and I wanna invite you to come and be a part of what he's doing. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? You know, maybe you're in this room this morning and you, you don't feel like you're ready to get baptized, but you, you know that there's a next step for you. Can I tell you? Jesus has chosen you, that Jesus died for you, that your story, you might be the one in the room and online that feels hopeless, feels like you're, you're down and out, feeling like you're dead and that there's no hope for you. Can I tell you, without Jesus, that's the reality. But the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus saves. 
And so if you're in this room this morning or you're joining us online and today would be the day that you say, for the first time in my life, I need to give my heart to Jesus. I need to say yes to Jesus. I need to ask God to save me so that I can have a story, so that I can know him fully. If that's you in this room this morning or online and you would say, for the first time in my life, I want to, scripture says this, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you would be saved. That's, that's the beginning of your story. And so if that's you today and for the first time in your life, you'd say, I need to give it all to Jesus. I'm gonna count down from three. And if that's you, I just want you to shoot your hand in the air so we can celebrate with you in person and online. If today's the day to, for salvation to, to impact you and you wanna experience Jesus on the count of three, two, one, would you just shoot your hand into the air to say, I need Jesus. I see you back there, we're with you, we're with you. Hey, if you're joining us online, hey, we're with you, man. If you're joining us online and today's the day to give your life to Jesus, I want you to scan that QR code and we've got a team that would love to reach out to you. Come on, can we make some noise for Jesus this morning that he saves, that he's alive, that he's moving? Come on, let's be prepared to share this week. Let's not sit back on the sidelines. Let's, let's be ready to be a part of the move of God that he's coming and he's moving and he wants to use your life. Freedom Church, we love you. We're out of here. I want, to, I want to encourage you to take these with you. Give them to somebody this week. Use the story that God has put on your life. And come on, let's do something because of what God has done to and through us. If you need prayer today, we got a prayer team on the sides. Freedom Church, we love you. Let's go outside and celebrate people going public. Hey, if you want to get baptized, we can still make it work. We love you.